everyone. My name is Brad from GenieCast, and I want to welcome you all to this cast, Venture Capital and New Markets with Explosive Potential, with John Chambers. Um, today is May 7th, and it is 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And I would like to now hand it off to Kevin Fallon, who is the YP of Gold Rocky Mountain. Kevin? Thank you very much, Brad. And hello, fellow YPO members. As the YPO Innovation Week inaugural chair two years ago, and the current YPO Entrepreneurship and Innovation Network chair today, it gives me great pleasure to kick off our 2018 YPO Innovation Week virtual series. I'd first like to thank Keith Alper, who is our 2018 YPO Innovation Chair for carrying the torch forward from those beginnings two years ago and has taken the uh, event and the sequence and series of events to a whole new level. For our virtual series kickoff, I'm very excited or thrilled, which may be actually an understatement, to introduce John Chambers, a global business legend. John joined Cisco as VP when it was 70 million uh, many years ago, came from Wang Laboratories and was promoted to CEO where he grew it from uh, the 70 million to 48 billion uh, before uh, leaving and starting JC2 Ventures to fuel the world startup community. He's had many, many awards and accolades and I'll only mention a few. He was uh, voted best boss of the year France's National Defense Gold Medal, the only business person in the world to have uh, achieved this award. Uh, he was voted as one of the 100 most influential leaders by Time Magazine. Uh, business Week went one further, one of the top 25 executives, and uh, he was voted CEO of the year by Chief Executive Magazine. Today, John will share with us some important experiences and some lessons learned and perspectives on the exciting world ahead of us. Now to conduct our interview today, where I will participate, uh, I would like to introduce Sally Shin. Sally is the San Francisco Bureau Chief for NBC and NBC, or CNBC, excuse me, and CNBC is the YPO Global Partner. Without further ado, uh, take it away, Sally. Thank you, Kevin. I'm also very excited to be here interviewing John, um, and I'm gonna kick it off. Um, right where you started. Um, you've been at Cisco for 25 years, uh, 20 years as CEO. Uh, you helped uh, build one of the biggest tech companies. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, growing the company from 70 million to 48 billion. I wanna start off with um, you. Tell me about your experience as a CEO and how much over the years um, has it changed? And what are some of the lessons uh, that you've learned uh, as CEO of a company like Cisco? Thank you, Sally. I'll jump right into it, but I want to thank Kevin for the very kind introduction. And Sally, it is great to be uh, working together again. We've done this off and on for almost a decade. <laughs> uh, I will try to share with the uh, listeners today what I would want to know if I were in your position, whether I was a company with 10 million in sales or 20 billion, what are some of the lessons learned both that work, but also some of the mistakes made so I can avoid it. I would deliberately be a little bit controversial. If you agree with everything I say, I will have failed. I want to make you occasionally uncomfortable because this market is moving with tremendous speed. So what's the same? The same has been for successful companies, you want to be driven by your customer. The same is basically the importance of culture for successful companies. The same is set out your vision of what's possible and stay true to that and make sure everything moves you toward those outcomes. And the same has been that you want to use technology to enable those goals. Now, what is different? The speed of change. Digitization will occur three to five times the speed that the internet transition occurred. Every company on this podcast will have to think about, are they a digital company first, specializing in retail or insurance or finance, et cetera. So every company here becomes literally a technology company with all the implications that go with it. And then also the importance of communications. You could be a great company 20 years ago or even 10, and as a CEO or a top leader, you didn't have to necessarily be great at communications. In today's world with social media, communications has to be a skill set up there with strategy and vision, the quality of your team, et cetera, that determines your future. So some things are the same, some things are changing, 
what's changing is speed of change, digitization, and the importance of communications. And going off of the speed of change you mentioned, back in the day, we've had Cisco, Oracle, SAP, uh, some of the biggest enterprise companies dominated tech. Now, if you look at the S&P 500, if you look at some of the biggest companies, they're consumer facing companies, companies like Apple, Amazon, Facebook. Why did we see that shift? When did we see that shift? And how has how has that change happened over the years? So Sally, breaking it down into a couple of questions that you ask, uh, if you think about technology companies, and you, you named them in terms of the Oracles of the world and the Cisco's of the world, et cetera, uh, they were enterprise companies. And it had to do with the internet from 1980 to about 2000. It was primarily driven by enterprise type companies that were on the leading edge of technology. And then the consumers tend to follow after the enterprise companies did it. Then in 2000, and I was honored to be at the Consumer Electronics Show at that year, I said the future is now going to be dominated by those that focus on the consumer and more what you would call the Facebooks, the Googles of the world, et cetera, in this new environment. And uh, that one lasted for almost two decades. Now, interestingly enough, I think you're going to see a blurring of the two. And I think it may actually go back to enterprise, perhaps leading to the technology changes whether those technology changes are as basic as artificial intelligence uh, or the changes are as basic as security, et cetera, or computing moving to the edge. I think you're gonna see more a blend of the two with probably dominated by the enterprise side of high tech. We'll see if that's right or wrong, but that's how I'd answer your question. Um, I wanna hone in on artificial intelligence. Today we've, we have the Microsoft Build Conference and then tomorrow Google yes. I.O. kicks off. We've got, how do you view uh, artificial intelligence as a strategy for companies, for a lot of the companies that are part of YPO? How are they thinking about it? Is it something that has to be innate within their business or is it something that they use as a service or how do you, how, what, what is some of the advice you would give to some of the YPO members? So you're asking several questions and let's start with the most basic. Artificial intelligence is here to stay. Uh, every company will be affected by artificial intelligence. So if you think about as you go digital from you know, literally only a thousand devices connected to the internet when Cisco is found to today with uh, 17 or 18 billion devices connected to 500 billion, connectivity is gonna be huge, but it is artificial intelligence which allows you to move with tremendous speed and everything becomes automated. So AI and artificial intelligence everywhere. For the people uh, watching this video, uh, what's important for you to know is how do you use artificial intelligence? Understand what is your core capability, what is fundamental to your differentiation, and what is context that you can get from other vendors, often high tech vendors that will allow you to be more effective on it. But it's here to say it's not a buzzword anymore. So you think about artificial intelligence and automation and everything we do, either replacing what we do as humans or literally making it simpler. And then what you have to do, both yourself as a leader and with your uh, workforce, you have to raise the skill levels to really be able to use this in a different way than before. True whether you only have 200 people in your organization or 25,000. A year or two that that might be using that technology well implemented within their business? Yeah, I'm sorry, you were out at the very beginning. Did you say examples? Yeah, examples of some companies that are using AI well in their, in their strategy. Well, they're everywhere. Yeah, and what, what is fascinating is often the real big companies look to the medium-sized companies or the smaller companies for innovation today because they see them moving even faster. But I don't know of a single company, large company in particular, that isn't aware that they need to have AI as part of their strategy. Now, everybody uses buzzwords and their slides look nice. It's do they really understand how this is fundamentally going to change? Do they understand what they're able to do different versus their peers? Do they understand how fast this move will occur? And are they disrupting or are they get disrupting in this new market? So I think it's important for each of your viewers to think about what does this mean to the industry I am in, the geography and how I use it. It doesn't need to be feared, but it does need to be understood in terms of how you take technology trends now that each of you are a technology company. And that wasn't true a decade ago. Everybody on this, this session today is a technology company, whether they know it or not, just specialized in the key area. So understanding what it means, understanding the context behind it, et cetera, and property position for the future. Great. 
Um, I did forget to mention at, at the top that um, if any of your uh, audience members, uh, if you guys have a question, um, there is a Q&A box that I believe is in the top left hand side of your chat box. So you guys can start sending the questions in um, and we'll get to that uh, in about 20 minutes. Uh, so I, I do want to continue and um, talk about JC2 Ventures, your current role. Um, well Go ahead. Why, yeah, why did you decide to go into venture um, after years of working at Cisco as your second end? Well, first, uh, uh, Cisco is my family, and, and as as uh, Kevin was kind enough to say, growing up from 400 people to 75,000 people was exciting and fun, and we rode the technology wave around the internet and changed how people work, lives, learns, and plays. It was important to me as part of my family. I wanted to make sure that transition to the next leader was very good. But I'd known for the last 10 years what I wanted to do next. I love to disrupt. I love small businesses getting big like the, the viewers on this. The, I love to compete. I wish I was a better person, but I have no intention of changing that. And I love to catch market transitions occurring. So when you think about where I go, whether it's a Cisco or my current role, uh, I'm looking at market transitions. I'm looking at the ability to grow and expand in the market and to create jobs. I love doing that with small to medium companies where you can be a coach to them, a strategic partner. So think of us not as a traditional VC, but more of a strategic partner that really helps companies scale and grow at a very rapid rate. And the good news and bad news is I've seen almost every movie there is to see. Sometimes we've handled it well, sometimes we've not. And for those viewers watching, something may surprise you. You're more product of how you handle your setbacks than you are your successes. And so having seen that movie so many times, to now do this with spatial purpose focus in terms of catching the major technology and business model trends, and then saying, how do you differentiate the companies you help coach? And to do it more in a true partnership with the CEO, as opposed to a traditional venture capital role, I get really excited about. And uh, it's really fun doing. I, I compare it to grandkids. Uh, I get to have all the fun with these companies, give them sugar, get them excited, provide advice. They think I'm reasonably intelligent and then give them back to management on Friday night and I go have a bourbon and ginger. <laughs> and, uh, I know my role, what it is and what it's not. Um, well, why don't you talk about some of your portfolio companies and or what are you what you are looking for in companies, some of the companies you have invested in, um, if you could. So let me do it in a way that each of you uh, viewers will think about it as well. I always look at market adjacencies where you can move and expand and grow your market and how you grow your existing markets. So the first thing I look at is the market transitions occurring. Those are business model or technology. Technology, the biggest one of all is digitization, the internet of things, artificial intelligence. And then as you think about that occurring, then computerization and the power and intelligence moves to the edge of the network. And then security becomes very, very key to it. And then literally voice, which I said would be free almost 20 years ago, voices become the primary interface. So when you look at where I'm focused, what I look at, and this is important for you all in the room to think about as well, I look at the first thing is, does the company really in the middle of a market inflection point? Do they have a market transition? I then look at the CEO and does she or he really differentiate their company? Do they have a crisp vision and strategy of where they want to go? Have they built a really good leadership team or around that? Are they able to communicate it? I then look at their customers. I'm, there's only one Steve Jobs. Steve just knew what to build. Mm -hmm. Most of us mere mortals, if we listen to our customers the right way, they'll tell you what the company is like. And so it's important to understand. I listen to the customers and say, here's what companies you should be acquiring or looking at as you move forward. Then it's the CEO. Does she want to, he, or he want to be coached in terms of the approach? And do they have sustainable differentiation, which can allow them to be number one and number two in the market? So I'm in the drone industry in terms of how you use drones to increase productivity and big data and the cloud in commercial uh, real estate, if you will, in manufacturing, uh, in job construction, in mining, et cetera. I'm in defensive drone capability for how you keep drones and protect your airspace and how do you do that through technology with a company called D-Drone. I'm in four major security plays from security in the data center 
to all the way to voice authentication with a company called Pendrop or protecting that phone that you have, the ability to slide it into a protective sleeve and it becomes nation state uh, preventing from somebody turning on your audio or your video uh, on open transparent government and trying to change the world and everything from security to drones all the way to solving world hunger with literally advanced robotic cricket farming, which your listeners will get a kick out of because it could dramatically change how we consume protein for the future and less expensive. And it could be the lobsters of the future. Now, in case anyone missed what I just did, about the time you think we're being aggressive as leaders and that we're thinking and dreaming big enough, you want to take a leap and think what's really possible. And so to really take that leap for me in ag tech and think about crickets and changing world hunger and making them the lobsters of the future and your everyday food, that was a rush. But what it does is keep me crisp and the ability to share that with others. So it seems like you do, you'd like to take an active approach as a, as a venture capitalist in your portfolio companies. Is, how important is a mentorship to you um, for a CEO of a startup? Well, I think whether it's mentorship or CEO of a startup or a large company, it's extremely important. And I'd be curious about out of uh, all the YPO members, how many of them have a key mentor or multiple mentors that make a difference? For me, from the time we were at uh, literally several hundred people uh, and uh, uh, less than 70 million in sales uh, to literally my last year as CEO, I would always have a set of advisors. Sometimes it would be people that you'd recognize, government leaders around the world, such as President Clinton and President Bush, uh, people in the media like Thomas Friedman, uh, the people that were really good on technology that I'd go to J.P. Morgan Chase or Walmart or Bank of America and say, what do you think about what I'm about to do? And it's one of the things that often uh, I think people underestimate the value of having a mentor that you can really trust a coach, if you will, a strategic partner to be able to bounce ideas off of because leadership is lonely. And you might be saying, well, leadership isn't. You've got all your team around you. Make no mistake about when things get tough, you're by yourself. And you've got to think about how do you have people that you can bounce ideas off of who've seen that movie before. And it doesn't mean you follow exactly what they say, but it allows you to put into what you try to do their thoughts and processes and perhaps identify the hurdles and potential mistakes you might make if you head down a different path. Um, I want to go into talking about scalability. Um, when you talk about mentorship and talking about growth in companies, um, it's important knowing how to uh, scale at high speeds. Um, and we've seen companies that have foregone culture uh, for growth. Uh, Uber may be an example that we can give here. Yes. You, on the other hand, has you've helped community, uh, you've helped craft a community during Cisco uh, when they saw massive growth. Yes. What are some of the advice you can give to this YPO audience about scal scalability and culture? Well, I think many of the YPO members might think about uh, when you scale, if you introduce, quote, process, that's like bureaucracy, and it would slow you down. And I thought the same thing, but boy, was I wrong. <laughs> For you to really move fast, you've got to have replicable, innovative processes that allow you to move with speed. So using Cisco as an example, I acquired 180 companies. We were what most people consider to be by far and away the best in the industry, but we had a replicatable process, the seven golden rules, if you will, of acquisitions. And we looked at how we incorporated that and made it on each decision. The same thing with attracting talent, the same thing with being number one and number two in a market, the same thing even all the way down to digitizing countries. That replicatable process did not only not slow you down, it sped you up. Something that you would understand, I could get a call on a Thursday night from the head of the NASDAQ saying, John, you're an idiot. Uh, you're missing one of the most important acquisitions going on and you're not even involved. And your competitors are about to take down this company and acquire them. It's a perfect fit for you. And I didn't even know the company. And once uh, the, the leader had shared with me what it was, I literally got my head of business development. We went over there the next morning, long story short, we announced a $3 billion acquisition. That was Thursday night, not knowing who they were, through both boards of directors and out Monday morning with a tremendous acquisition for over $3 billion. The point that I'm making is innovative process allows you to move with speed. Culture, however, is the foundation for your strategy. 
many people, and I did absolutely as a young CEO, miss how important culture was. And then I began to understand it more. You never have a great company without a great culture. And uh, the culture can be good or bad. Uh, I agree with you on the analysis that Uber took growth over a great culture. And it was a culture uh, was the breakdown that it caused their current challenges. And so it's important when you think about the role of a CEO, strategy and vision for the company, uh, develop the leadership team to implement it culture, and then communications. And as I said in the very opening comment, communications becomes more and more part uh, that determines your success or not as a leader, much more important than it was a decade ago. Do you advise companies to get outside counsel, let's say, if, they, if their company is too small to have an HR in place? Or what are some of, the, some of the advice you would give to a company that might be struggling with some of these cultural issues? So I think that uh, culture and HR, and I prefer to call it the cultural lead is the HR person, that is core to your capabilities. Context is what others can do better that is not core. So I think you never lose control of your core culture HR responsibility. Now, can you have one person doing that and use an ecosystem of partners that specialize in everything from recruiting uh, to how you handle crisis management to how you do social media? The answer is yes. But the CEO, she or he has to own the culture and they have to therefore really be close to the HR lead. And then you can do core versus context on how much you have internal staff or not have in terms of the direction. But I really underestimated how impactful culture was to our success at Cisco. My attrition rate ran less than 5% for the entire 20 years I was there in a voluntary attrition in an industry that runs in the mid-teens. And one of the reasons we acquired so well versus others, our culture accepted outsiders. And so culture to me is such an important part. And while I don't think it eats strategy for lunch, it is absolutely a peer in terms of the direction. So back to the HR, the HR person is a very important part of your, your team. And I personally suggest that HR and most all my startups report to the CEO. Um, I wanna switch gears and talk about two regions you're very excited about, uh, France okay. and India. You are currently the chairman of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, and I believe yes. you are also appointed global ambassador of the French tech by uh, Macron, uh, President Macron. Yes. Uh, why do these two regions, and you and I spoke about this a little bit, um, yes. excite you and why? Well, what is fun is in my new role, I only do the things I really love, <laughs> and I don't have to do things that were necessary to do when you're in a real large company. So I tend to focus on where the market transitions occurring, both within the market technology, within companies, business model wise, and within countries. And what will surprise people on this product, you know, on this uh, uh, viewership is that France has become the innovation leader for Europe. And uh, if you would ask me three years ago, would I want to invest in France and would it be a great place to do business and startups? Uh, I just saw the changes occur and I said, there's a fundamental change occurring, and it did. It became, in three years, the number one startup nation in Europe, and Macron is as good as you hear. He absolutely is a mover and a shaker. Uh, he's a good man, a great visionary. He makes the tough decisions, even when they may not be popular in the short run. Interestingly enough, India, halfway around the world, a different country, obviously, 1.3 billion people, but Modi is an amazing leader who is going to digitize his country and understand what that means to an extra two to three points of GDP growth, to creating 1.2 million jobs per month, to the importance of a very healthy business community, which allows companies to grow and survive across all 29 states. And so you see in these two leaders, probably two of the very tops in the world, a common theme, even though you differ in languages and the size of one is 20 times the size of the other country, but similar philosophies in terms of approach. And so it really comes back down to, Kevin, you would probably agree, in all of these YPO organizations, in the end, it's all about your leadership. If you have great leadership, uh, you can move at the speed that is needed. If you don't, you're going to really struggle as you go forward in terms of differentiation. Who would have thought 
that India would be a mover and shaker rather than a fast follower. <laughs> Who would have thought France would ever Never be a good place to do business? Sally, a great place to go have dinner or a romantic <laughs> weekend, but never to do business. It yeah. changed in three years. And that's the takeaway for your listeners. Anybody who believes that you have to disrupt others or you're going to get disrupted doesn't understand the market. You've got to be disrupting all the time. And you've got to, as a leader of YPO, be operating outside your, your comfort level. If you're not uncomfortable with what you're doing, you're not moving fast enough, you're not introducing enough change. Change. If you don't have crickets in terms of your philosophy about dreaming and changing the world, a cricket-like example, you're not pushing the envelope hard enough. So then where, where does the US rank in terms of entrepreneurship? This is a tough one. And uh, for those of us who are in the U.S., it's something that you can never take anything for granted or feel there's entitlement. The U.S. ought to be number one or number two in innovation, and I think most of us would say it has been. Today on Bloomberg's uh, Innovation Index, it dropped out of the first 10 for the first time ever in our history. In terms of startups and small companies growing more rapidly, more going out of business than are being formed, and uh, we are not in the top 10 in the world, not only on innovation, but startup momentum. Uh, we have to get that changed. It needs to be the top priority for the US. It was good in terms of the tax law changes, but that was just a step that I've been lobbying for for 20 years to give you an idea how slow we're moving. These other countries, whether it's France or India, make their changes in a year. And Modi demonetized his currency in a weekend. And uh, Macron is doing labor law reform in the first year uh, in office. We have to move with the same speed if we're going to really be successful. A case that many people would understand, I came out of Boston 128 with Wang Laboratories. It was the high tech center of the world just 20 and 25 years ago and 30 years ago. That's where all the hot startups were, the mini computer companies, et cetera. Yet we did not change. And a thousand companies literally disappeared in a area called Silicon Valley that we had very little awareness of or respect for became the dominant force. Same thing can happen to Silicon Valley if we're not careful. And even though you just moved to San Francisco, Sally, <laughs> you want to hope that it doesn't. But it, the minute you think that you can just keep doing the thing, same thing, what gets everyone in trouble is when you keep doing the same thing for too long. If you're not reinventing, if you're not innovating in today's world, you're going to get left behind and you probably will not be here a decade from now. So do you think we'll see less people coming to Silicon Valley or are we seeing that already? I think Silicon Valley has to be very careful. We've moved from the good guys in the world to people now begin to think about, are we good guys or are we bad guys? I think the Valley has to get much more in tune with our customers and focus on inclusive growth, both in this country, across all 50 states and around the world, and be in more of a mode of listening as opposed to telling others what they have to do. At the same time, Stanford is a engine with the venture capitalists here that is hard to match in terms of new ideas and new concepts. So I don't think it's a given which way it's gonna go, but I do think it's a wake up call for the Valley. We either disrupt and continue to be good corporate citizens on a global basis, or we will get disrupted. Um, I do want to ask about China. Uh, we're seeing a lot of companies come out of uh, China. We've had Xiaomi, who just recently filed for an IPO. Um, there's a lot of unicorns that are coming out of the region. What are your thoughts on doing businesses in China, um, which, especially when there seems to be a, a dark cloud over you know, a possible trade war, and we've seen things with ZTE happen? So a series of questions. Uh, the first is that China is the second largest economy in the world, and at a point in time, it will probably be the first. So if you're truly going to be a global company, you have to have a strategy for China. Secondly, and Sally, you worded it well, as a leader, you never make decisions on what I'd call symptoms or points in time. You make the decisions on where you want to be two, three, five years out, and you don't let short-term disruptions change that view. Will the relationships between China and the U.S. go up and down a little bit over time? Absolutely. Uh, do I think over time they'll be up and to the right? Yes, I do. So as you think about your, your strategy on a global basis, uh, you want to think about the role that China will play. But also, I want to be true to a point in time. I bet on China 23 years ago, 1995. I bet on China when almost no one else did. Uh, 
And what I did was see the market transition. And I had an unfair advantage coming out of Wang Laboratories with knowing what was going to occur. Today, countries I'm betting on will surprise people, India and France. So I go to where the market transition is and yet never lose track of what the big picture and how it's most likely to unfold. Uh, I'm going to ask you one last question before we get to the Q&A portion. Um, okay. So I want to ask you, you were a CEO of Cisco for 20 years. Uh, there yes. are many CEOs listening to us right now. What is the one advice um, you could give them? I think it's so important that a CEO, she or he, may fall into the trap of just doing their job and continuing to do the same thing. I think it's important to take a step back and say, what is your, your, your real job? Your real job is strategy and vision for your company. The second real job is develop, retain, recruit, and change the leadership to implement that strategy and vision. The third is culture. And it's so important to the future of your company. Even if it isn't a strong culture, as long as it's predictable, it will determine your success or not. And then communications. But within all of that, given that those are your four roles, it's how do you spend your time? So I think the number one piece of advice that I would give the people listening today up in YPO is I would look at what is those four elements you're doing and how do you allocate your time to each of the four? Great. Okay. Sally, well, before you tee up for questions, I have a few questions I'd like to uh, ask yeah, you, John. Kevin. And, and, and a little bit of a, a drill down. Uh, you mentioned uh, what you look for in companies and CEOs when you invest in them. And yes. I remember seeing somewhere where you talked about Lighthouse customers. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think it would be helpful because from my belief with all of these acquisitions you did at Cisco, it could be very helpful for our members to understand really in a drill down how you actually think about an acquisition. And I remember also you mentioned about culture. If there wasn't a fit uh, there, you, you, you nixed the whole deal when you were at Cisco. So just give us kind of that holistic framework with, with some focus on the lighthouse type customers. I think that was critical. Yeah, I think you, you, you nailed on that one, Kevin. Whether it's a small company we're acquiring or a big company in today's market, you want to really view yourself as a leader. Are you getting those transitions right? And do you uh, include outsiders into your company as you grow forward? Uh, the focus on acquisitions is more how do you move into market, new markets. If I have time to do it myself, I do it myself. If I don't have time, I go acquire one of the top three to five. And I had the golden rules to go with that. Do you have a common view of the industry? Could you keep the people you're acquiring? Because when you acquire a technology company, and remember over time, every company will become a technology company. You're acquiring the people to generate the next uh, generation of products. And so being able to keep the people you acquire becomes key. In this industry, about 22 to 25% turnover occurs after an acquisition per year. Ours ran about 4%. So we did a good job of identifying where the similarities were. It's as hard as you hear, Kevin, acquiring. Uh, if I knew how difficult it was, I might not have ever started on it. But if you do it right, it has huge competitive advantages. So don't underestimate the time and the degree of difficulty. But it goes back to being driven by your customers. Your customers will tell you who you should acquire. Your customers, if you listen to them, will tell you what you need to do. Many of us on this uh, uh, session today would say we have great customer service. Yet, 80% of the CEOs say we do. And when you ask our customers, only less than 8% say we do. So being customer driven on everything from what are you doing right to who you should acquire all the way down to having an innovation process to make it work. One of my key takeaways. Just to follow up on that. And then I do have two other questions. The sure. um, at JC uh, two ventures right now, when you're looking at it, one of the fledgling uh, early stage and you're looking at them, I think I heard where you, you look at, you go out and interview the customers and, yes. and try and align if those customers truly align with the strategy of the company, I think, and are they happy? That, and I think you called them lighthouse, yes. lighthouse customers. Yes. So what I do is, uh, and it, it's important that this also applies to what I did at Cisco for my own customers. I was constantly listening to customer satisfaction. How do they view us? I paid everybody in the company on customer satisfaction. I don't think everybody's ever done that before, and I did for two decades. I also listened to every critical account in the world every night. 
because if I paid attention to it, everybody did. And were we there at the time the customers need us most in terms of direction? And so when I look at these startups, or if I were being candid, if you asked me to come in to look at even one of the companies that in this group that might have 100 or 200 million in revenue, I would look to their strategy and vision. I'd look at the CEO, but then I'd look to their leading customers. What did the customers really think of them? Did they really believe in the strategy and vision? Was the CEO involved with those customers? When there was a problem, were they there to protect them? Uh, did they really put the customer's interest first, which is the way I think you sell, and the direction? And so when I go to look at startups and do I invest in them or back to the days when I was acquiring, you know, probably 10 to 20 companies a year, uh, if they didn't have really good customer references that would say this is the right company to do and the culture is really right and they listen to me and they fo focus on my needs being first, I wouldn't acquire the company no matter how good the finances were. Right, right. So one other uh, question then. You brought, up, and, uh, you brought up transitions a few times. In other words, and I think one time you said very humbly that you've made many mistakes. What you've really got right is transitions and people. Yes. On the transitions, what I, I see a lot of times companies do their strategic planning and they just have a group of executives show up. They remince whatever. Yeah. And when you look at the energy in the room, the sheer bias is on an internal operations world. How... Yes. Can you share with us how Cisco kept the whole concept of insight, the market insight, which is obviously watching for those transitions. Yes. How, what process did you have in place to keep the eye on the ball of where the technologies were going and the market shifts? So the first thing I did as CEO uh, was to outline here are the transitions I see going on and here's both the advantages and the challenges they'll create for us. And then I literally forced the company to be customer driven. There was not a choice on it. We didn't bring people into the company who didn't understand the importance of transitions. And that's when you move into new market adjacencies. It's also when you can get disrupted yourself and uh, no one in the company, it was not acceptable to not put the customers first in terms of your thinking and your prioritization. And so your ability to identify those transitions to then move with speed was key. And so when I'd bring the people into a virtual or a physical room, I would start with one of the transitions, would have people present off of business development. Here's what's occurring. We'd share with our own data in terms of what our customers think are the important transitions. Here's what's occurring. And then we'd say, here are the market adjacencies we're looking at moving into. And then on some of the more controversial issues, uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a company with a couple hundred employees or uh, 200,000, I would take small teams and have one team evaluate that we ought to do something, i.e. the green team, and here's all the reasons. Then I'd have another team, the red team, that would say, here's why we shouldn't do it with all the reasons. And I'd often put people on the teams opposite of what they really wanted to view. So it forced them to really think through the implications. Okay, that's that's great. Thank you. Sally, you want to take over with some questions? or? Sure. Well, I want to take a step further. One of the questions that came through uh, was about your succession strategy. Um, yes. About transition. Um, how, how did you, what was the process um, of your succession plan and how did you sort of execute that? It's an important one because whether it's a medium-sized business succession plan to the CEO or large heart attack business, it is really difficult. In our industry, the transitions of the high-tech leaders have been a disaster. I mean, if you look back through the years and you can name Dr. Wang and Ken Olson, the mini computer days, uh, you could name uh, Bill Gates and we could go through all the names uh, of the various high tech companies. And when they turned over to their first CEO, many times the, C the company either went sideways or crashed or burned or never came back. In fact, there are almost no successes. And so I knew how hard it would be. And I thought about it for a year because it's my family and I wanted to make sure this transition occurs just like many of the CEOs listening today are thinking about their future. But I thought about it for 10 years and I studied it for 10 years. So I did what Kevin asked me the question on. I defined success at the beginning. We want this to be one of the best high tech transitions ever knowing it's gonna be difficult. And then we said, what are we gonna do different than our peers to make that happen? And then I'm a believer in writing the press release before you make your first move on the chessboard. We said the press release will be this, how we did our CEO transition will be taught in Harvard at the Harvard Casebook Studies. All the above happened. 
And so we outlined a vision of what the possible outcome would be we wanted. We said, here's how we're going to have to do it differently. And it had to be owned by the board, not by me. If it were my choice and I was going to move on to do something else, then the first bump that happened, the board wouldn't be bought in. The board had to own the responsibility for this transition working well, although obviously I was a strong influence on who we selected. Um, and this question is from Perry. Um, he's asking about team compensa compensation, uh, equity uh, versus salaries, and some of the lessons or, or learnings from your days at Cisco, if you could. Well, there's so many lessons, learnings, and mistakes. <laughs> so uh, one thing that I, I, I did that, that I learned and I got stronger at is I would regularly rank your leaders. And it doesn't matter if you're ranking your top 10 or your top 100, I would usually rank my top 100. And then I encourage each of my functional groups to do the same. I ranked them on what is their current contribution and future expectations of them. In other words, their potential, 50-50 on both. So I'd rank the leaders and then, interestingly enough, I'd look at what their compensation is, what were their golden parachutes, if you will, or but better, what were their incentives to stay with the company, and was I paying people in the way I ranked them? And it's, it, it points out a lot of gender diversity issues, which need to be changed, but also it was amazing how sometimes number 60 on the list was getting paid in the top 10, or number four or five on the list was getting paid down at 50% level. And so it allows you to look at how you pay versus how you rank them. You also want to look at how you're paying versus the market. We made a conscious decision. We wanted to pay at the 75th percentile level, not at the 90th, but definitely not at the 40th and be realistic of where we're paying versus where we want to pay and what we think is a key part of our strategy in terms of direction. But if there's one takeaway, I'd rank your, your people and then look at how you're paying them and make sure that what you are paying them carries forward to what you want them to do. I'm a believer you want to both do salary plus some type of incentive based on the company's objectives. If you just do salary uh, with a bonus based on how you do your individual silo, you lose track of did the company achieve its goals as well. So I like the blended version of the two. All right, this next topic is um, a topic that everybody loves talking about, blockchain. Yes. Uh, blockchain is getting a lot of press and more new startups are using blockchain. Do you see trends continuing? And what do you think of the trend using ICOs to fund their companies instead of traditional venture funding? So two con similar concepts, but different views. If you look at high tech, we almost get too excited about something before it happens. Then about the time it slows down, then the elbow takes off. That was definitely true in digitization. I was too early there at Wang, there eight, I'm sorry, at Cisco there almost eight and a half years ago. And then when it retook off three to four years ago, we were positioned well, but those first three years were a little bit hard. I think blockchain is a little bit overhyped at the present time. However, I do think it will make a dramatic difference in supply chain to everything else. On the issue about can technologies enable different business models, the funding of companies, the venture capital funding, or even taking them public will change. And so it's important to understand if you're the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ as an example, how different new models will come in in terms of how companies go public. Or do they ever go public in a traditional way? Can they get their funding from a series of other investors as you move forward? The companies I always worried about as competitors weren't my traditional competitors. It's the one who got these new market transitions right, and he would come at me often from below in a way that I didn't see him coming. So that's kind of how I view blockchain. <clears throat> Absolutely here to stay, perhaps a little bit overhyped at this present time, but I do think it will be a different maker looking out uh, three, five, and 10 years. So you're also pro ICOs then, it seems like. I think it's a interesting way that's going to see how it occurs. There are a lot of weaknesses. Everybody always looks at the positive without some of the weaknesses on it. Uh, I went in with the uh, NASDAQ when I went public and I'm a huge fan of them uh, in terms of how valuable they were to me for helping the company go public 
to helping me do the job well, to providing advice and criticism to me about what I had to do better in protecting and listening to my shareholders, et cetera. So I think there are a lot of advantages that traditional ways have if they reinvent themselves. And I don't think it's a given which way the market's going to go. I don't think it's going to be a win-lose. Uh, but I think the blend of that, how much is it 10%, 90% or 50-50 will depend on how some of these new technologies are implemented. And are the initial ones that go out this way successful? All right. Uh, the next question is from Seth. Um, as a 29 year old running a $30 million company in a traditional mature industry, what technology would you suggest I start evaluating while we define our approach to digitization? So ask Seth what industry he's in. I understand 29, but is he in manufacturing retail? That will help me a little bit on the answer if he can get back to you. So to answer your question, uh, I think CEOs are gonna get younger, not older. And that's a surprise to those of us with experience. I think every CEO that I interface to on the startup is coming down in age. And I think the same is true with a company that's 70 million sales or two to 300. In terms of technologies you wanna think about, uh, you wanna think about what enables you to interface to your customer better. And so really understanding how do you change that customer experience, which allows you in a traditional industry to gain a competitive advantage. But remember the comment I said before, 80% of the CEOs in his industry probably think they do a good job on customer service or experience, and the customers would say less than 80% of them would say they do. Oh, Seth so said industrial distribution. Okay, so on distribution in the key industry, it's how do you really stay on top of your, your customer expectations and your distributor expectations, and how is that changing in terms of direction? And how do you really no, are you really providing value to your customers or are you commodity-like? If you're commodity-like, you better be streamlined for price. If you're really adding differentiation, customers will pay a premium for it. But in the traditional industry, I always like traditional industry. I think it's predictable and very often the traditional players are hesitant. In fact, the most difficult companies to change of all are those that have been very successful to disrupt themselves. So I like where he is. Uh, I like it at what I call medium-sized company. And I think aggressively about how do you disrupt some of the big players? How do you move faster? Then the second part of the thing that I give you a suggestion on would be for him to look at what is his true differentiation. And don't kid himself. Does he have differentiation? What is it? What will be his differentiation two to three years out versus his peers? And if you struggle in answering that question, that in and of itself is a warning signal. Um, let's see, we have about a little over 10 minutes. Um, next one comes from... Let me jump in, Sally, if I can. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah, Take go care. for it. So uh, one other thing uh, around the whole uh, leadership uh, would be, I think one time you said education is your equalizer or the equalizer out there, John. So yes. I have a question actually from my good friend who is uh, taking over as chair from the, uh, for the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Network, Tim Gentry. Yes. His question really is, how have you transformed as a leader? How have you, I mean, you've gone through massive change from this smaller company yes. to a mega global organization. And the second part of the question is, how have you brought along the leadership team with you? Because that seems like a huge challenge for every CEO. If they're out there gunning for the future disruption, how do you get the executives reporting to you to actually come along as far as opposed to, um, having to churn them as the company goes through those transitions? So a series of questions going in the reverse order. Uh, it is so important that as a CEO of a company, regardless of the size of your company, that your leadership team is in sync with where you view the vision and strategy to go, what your culture is going to be to accomplish that vision and strategy, and how you evolve your leadership team, both current and future ones, uh, to implement that. And that's where communication becomes so key. So the first thing I believe you've got to do is communicate where you're going to go, what you're going to do differently, and be candid with what you're doing well and what you have to improve on. But this is where I don't give my leaders a choice. We debate up front where we're going. Then it's the job of the CEO for she or he to say, here's where we are going. And I expect everybody to come in line. It doesn't mean you don't want healthy give and take while you're making the decision of where to go. But once you start to go, you need to be uh, focused on how do you do this together. 
That doesn't mean, however, you don't have constant healthy give and take or a little bit of constructive friction on how do you get there. I think that's actually very healthy in terms of the implementation as you move forward. And to your point, education, both how you develop your leaders, and I encourage you to send your leaders to continuing education, including technology education for leaders, uh, so they stay current in their industry becomes key. On the bigger picture of education, I am very worried about the U.S. Our K through 12 system is broken. We are no longer competitive in that, uh, not even in the top 30 in the world. And while our university system is still better than our global counterparts, that delta is narrowing. So I believe, and my parents are both doctors, education is the equalizer in life, but along with education, digitization or technology is the second equalizer. And so how you use the power of the internet and digitization along with education would determine your future as an individual contributor, a company, or as a country. And uh, I think that personally, we need this to be a national agenda to change our education system at a much faster pace. Interestingly enough, France, which has always had a very good education system, is changing at tremendous speed and disrupting themselves. Uh, you see India, which has not always had a good education system, Modi thinking entirely differently. And I think most world-class companies, regardless of their size, will constantly look at how they educate their existing workforce and their leaders. So as automation and AI takes over certain jobs, you can continue to move your company and your leaders and your employees into higher level jobs that provide a different type of value. Sally? Yeah. Uh, this one comes from Dan Knox. Um, and it, it, going back to the transition theme, um, yes. he asks, Cisco managed the evolution from a products company selling a hardware and software in transactional model to a service focus with a greater focus on service as a service, uh, reoccurring revenue. And what are the key considerations uh, were in that strategy for your transition? Gotcha. So uh, again, a number of, of questions, part of which is accurate, part of it is, is not quite as much. Uh, if you watch Cisco, we had always been a quote hardware company, but 85% of our engineers were software. So we used software to re bring home the power of the hardware and custom uh, silicon, uh, what they call ASICs to implement the combination of hardware and software together. We moved from being a router company to a switching company, to a voice company, to a video company, to a day center company, to a collaboration company, to a security company, and then transition to focus on outcomes and recurring revenues. Recurring revenues is a business model evolution. The outcomes is how you provide that regardless of how your customers view it. So we moved from providing a product the customers figured out how to use to providing products that tied together in architectures that focused on outcomes. And what it does, even though I rattled them off quickly, these are the transitions we went through literally every other year at Cisco for the last 25 and we'll continue to go over the next 25. So you've got to constantly reinvent yourself. If you don't, you're falling behind. Right. So pivoting in and, and identifying market trends is, is key yes. for, for a lot of these companies. I think uh, it's the most important one. If you were to say, what do you watch more than anything else? Get your market trends right. Technology, changing customer buying behavior, other trends that are so important to know. And so what are your advice to some of the startups that might be looking to get acquired or, or sell to companies like Cisco? What, what, what is, something, what is uh, something that you need to do in order to impress a Cisco board? Gotcha. So if you want to sell your company, I would argue you ought to lead it exactly like you want to develop it to go public because companies don't want to buy somebody who wants to be bought. It usually means they set it up and they were looking at a short term exit, including probably them moving on to do the next startup. So when I look to uh, a company to buy, it's the same as look to one to invest in. Uh, I know that over 55% of the startups that I interface to exit strategies to be acquired. So if you're thinking about that, you want to go back to how do you become the number one and number two player in your small segment of the market where you're playing? What is your differentiation that an acquirer can't get somewhere else? How are you going to be different long-term than others? How do you build the best leadership team who can provide 
what the company's buying, who acquired you, and do it in a very effective way, and how do you be customer driven? So if you do those well, you're very much capable of being acquired and often may become a target of a Cisco or somebody else and then decide if you want to be acquired or not. But I would not fall into the trap of just thinking short term so you can be acquired and then thinking that's going to be your key. Because if you built your system based on short term, you're probably not a company somebody wants to acquire. So I'd say, how do you do both, even if your end goal is to be acquired? Right, right. Good point. Uh, this next question, and um, maybe a few more. Uh, this question is from Gaurav. Uh, industrial IoT, big data and predictive maintenance are fast growing trends. Can you share your views on opportunities in the field operations space from the viewpoint of a field worker? Ah, so all of those tie together, and that goes back to the answer question I think Kevin asked me earlier, and so Gaurav, I appreciate the question, is these are actually tied together. And so if you think about IoT separate than artificial intelligence, thinking about it separate than security, thinking about it separate than intelligence at the edge of the networks as opposed to back in the cloud, uh, you end up with perhaps the wrong answer. It's how they actually come together. And so it is important for a field worker or a company with a large number of field workers in place to talk about how that role would change. How will those field workers use technology to come to the edge of the network and how do you make it happen? So if you're a field worker that used to go out and climb on top of uh, roofs after a major storm or a hell storm, uh, first it's very dangerous very difficult to do and uh, uh, it, it is something you probably can't stay in past a certain age because of the agility that often affects us as we get a little bit older. Uh, today that field worker is probably going to go out to that house take a drone out of the trunk of his or her car, fly the drone over top of the house in a fraction of the cost with dramatically different safety, interface to the intelligence of the cloud and the website, and then give back the quote to the customer while you're still on site with how they, uh, what's going to be the insurance payment for them. So you can move up market with the skills that you need that are dramatically different than the skill a field worker had just before. But a lot more of our tasks that are the man, manual, excuse me, are more likely to be performed by artificial intelligence and technology. So you've got to think about how you as a company or you as an employee upscale your capability to use that. It doesn't mean you won't make as much money. In fact, you can make potentially dramatically more, but you have to say, how does each one of us not fear, but embrace technology. And then how do we look at how we get our education and skills up so we can use it effectively? Got it. Um, I wanted to go back to culture, which I think is such a key and important topic for entrepreneurs. Um, this question comes from Nick. Okay. Uh, John, you have repeatedly mentioned the importance of corporate, corporate culture in a successful company. With all employees having different views and priorities related to corporate culture, what have you seen as a common aspect of corporate culture across successful cultures? Is it things like creating a family look and feel where all the employees, regardless of level, feel important? Um, for example, like a Google or creating a fun environment that attracts the masses or a think tank culture where the best uh, brightest want to go? So it's an important one. It's a great question, Nick. Uh, when you look at a culture is not a cool place to, to go sit and, and, and comfort level with your, your food being brought to you and, and how cool is your, your headquarters. Culture is really about the underlying mission and vision for your company and the values you have to deliver on it. And it's something that many people get wrong. I'm almost a believer in putting culture mentally in their person's head or on their belt with their employee badge about what is the culture and direction. And the common aspects of culture is understand it has to be tied to what the CEO really believes. Make no mistake about it, a culture, be it good or bad at a Microsoft, an Intel, a Netflix, a Google, a Cisco are different. But all of them have very strong and very... Uh, expectations you want to follow to be successful there based on the culture you're in. And so if you're a CEO as part of YPO, understand what is the culture you want and you have to own it and you've got to walk it. For me, key elements of the culture was to find your mission the right way and your vision and strategy to get there. And then what are the values you bring built upon it? And these values may vary by company, even though you might be after the same market, the value of making innovation happen. 
the value of customer first or not, the value of treating others like you'd like to be treated yourself as a family, uh, the value of just doing the right thing. Now, if you'd use those as an example, Uber would not have gotten into the trouble that they did if they had those as key parts of their values. So I think the culture is your foundation for what you do, but don't kid yourself. You can have great companies whose culture on how you view people are dramatically different. There are many companies that are extremely successful that have turnover, forced turnover of 10% a year and a up or out type culture. There are others like a Cisco and like what I hope the majority of my startups will build, which are more of a family type culture, very high expectations, but you win or lose as a family and you're there for that family when they need you most often around a family crisis with an illness, either uh, the employee, their spouse or their children. And I followed every one of those uh, for almost 20 years at Cisco. Uh, that I knew about that was life-threatening and we were there for them like no one else. And by the way, the reason our attrition rate was 5% or below in an industry that was in the teens is how our culture and how we treated our people uh, allowed us to achieve our goals. Did I ever have low expectations? Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. Was I very demanding as a leader? You betcha. Did I set goals that at times were aspirational that people thought couldn't happen, number one and number two, in almost every product category we went after? Probably. Do I have any regrets? No. My only regrets that I wasn't more aggressive and actually pushing the envelope even harder. I think that's a great uh, place to end it right here. Kevin, do you have any last minute? Well, I think we're at the top of the hour, Sally, and I appreciate everything. If I could have the last word it could, and, and only the last word, it would be like, uh, John, it's time to drop the mic. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all it's an honor so I, hope, I hope everybody didn't agree with everything i said i hope that if you learned one or two things that help you be a better leader as part of ypo we accomplished it uh kevin i love the way you set us up and sally it is a fun being interviewed by you uh, <laughs> I had a lot of fun thank as you. well thank, thank you thank you so much yp innovation week onward thanks Take guys care. thanks thank you